discussion. Right, okay. Welcome to the fourth in the series of five um, back in 2020 series talks. Um, we've got Pete Silver from the architecture department talking around building information modeling and designing the book. I think the uh, key things that I want to sort of say to you guys is um, we'll, we'll have 20 minutes of uh, Pete talking, um, think of your questions, and then we'll have 20 minutes of QA after that. Okay? So without further ado, hand you over to Pete. Thank you. Um, okay, well, you're a very unique group of people because you come to these lectures. And you're, this is the first time we've had a lecture series at all since I've been here in this university, which is about 12 years, which crosses over all of the uh, schools in the university. So, in theory, we have construction managers here. Hands up, construction managers. Yeah, well, they're tutors anyway. Um, any uh, town plan? There should be some town planners. There should be. Don't, all right. In theory, this is a, 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 a you know a vehicle for us to be talking to each other. The reason it's happening is because of um, building information modelling. The reason that the school, this uh, faculty, is talking about is getting you guys to talk to each other is because of this this phrase, building information modeling. And it's, only, it's a phrase that I first heard about six years ago, um, maybe more actually, six or seven years ago, when one of our ex students was working for HOK Sport, and he came to the office and said, he, um, we really need to get up to speed with building information modeling, because if you're going to design a football stadium in uh, Poland, that's what, they, that's what the expectation is going to be, that you are you will commit to this concept of BIM. So what BIM has done is it's given us the opportunity as a school, as a place of learning, to bring um, all the different faculties together. And in the time that I've been here, and I think Ads will agree, uh, Rob will agree, um, successive deans of this school have not enabled the communication between the different uh, schools within the faculty. And it's a great shame because in our profession, uh, and I'm talking about how I mean architects now, um, we have to deal with um, a whole range of issues. And we, as architects, used to think of ourselves very much as this, as this place here. Um, we used to think of ourselves as the centre <coughs> of where communication and interaction between all the other disciplines in order, in, in order to get things built in the world, um, we were the spiders, if you like, at the centre of the web. And, and that was important to us, and if you look at the history of architecture, it, a lot of what we were trained to do, and we still are trained to do, is to be able to communicate in many different languages, if you like. Um, the language of um, a structural engineer, the language of an environmental engineer, of the contractor, of the client, of the fabricator, and each of them has their own way of looking at the world. And our training, I, I've always assumed that our training was about being able to communicate with all these different disciplines, if you like, so that we can draw, a, a drawing for a client is a different drawing than it will be for a contractor, which is a different drawing that you'll, you will use to get planning permission. Anyway, we're no longer here. We're now, we've been shoved into a component in a bigger system. Rightfully or wrongly. So what the, the statement at the top there is is something I very much believe. I don't think anything has changed or will change because of building information modeling in terms of the relationships between the different disciplines that enable things to get built. Except, you know, for once, you're all that you well, I think there's quite a lot of architects here today, funny enough, but in theory. Uh, all the students in this building, for once, are, are coming into the same room and listening to the same conversations. And it's a shame that I, there's quite a few architects students here that haven't been here uh, over the last few weeks because you would have got to meet um, more um, people that are going to build the buildings for you in the future. And that's sort of part of what we, um, the, the group here, the Lebecki group, have been trying to do, is we're trying to get you to start talking to each other at this level so that it's not the process does not become adversarial when you go out into the real world of profession, which it has historically been. 
architect tries to get planning permission. Planners go, architects. Mm, no, do what, we, do what you tell us to do. Can guys try to make buildings. You architects, you don't know what you're talking about. I've dealt with, build, you know, I've, I have built buildings, many buildings in my life, and I know very clearly that it is all about communication. And the lectures over the last month that have been going on here, this has been, this has come up time and time again. Um, from Rob, from Ed, from all the people in construction managers are saying time and time again, this is all about communication. If we can communicate with each other through drawings directly, then we'll be fine. Anyway, as most of you probably know, most of the architects certainly know, it's the software that has changed things. And uh, this graph keeps coming back time and time again in, in uh, the world of building information modeling because it's the kind of um, uh, Bible, if you like, of, of where we are and where we want to be. Certainly in Europe, possibly it's a kind of, it's a kind of world model. Um, so what I've been asked to do today is to talk about level zero. <laughs> Architects, you see? Level zero. Um, but what I will do in, I've only got ten minutes, that's ten minutes gone already, is to just quickly zip through or try and explain the fact that we, unfortunately for the rest of the world, we are involved right the way down the line here, right to the end. We don't just sit here at level zero doing CAD, and neither should uh, people in the construction industry, neither should people that fabricate uh, building elements consider that they click in at certain phases in this operation. In an ideal world, what happens at level zero is that we all um, communicate with each other. So. It is true that we're interested in drawings, lines, arcs, and texts. Architects are. Architects are also interested in models, objects, and collaboration. Architects are also interested in integrated, operable, interoperable data. As all of you are, I have no doubt that you're all interested. There's, there's nobody here, I'm sure, that's studying construction management that isn't interested in drawings. So this is for all of us. It's not just for architects. Um, but I've been asked to come and talk to you about design input in building information modeling. And in, since the 1990s, when I was studying architecture, the main, um, if you like, the biggest single change in our world has been computing. And this phrase, computer-aided design, has been a part of my life, most of it, actually. And somebody asked that question which is still needs, still needs uh, exploring and asking. In my office, when we're, when we're designing, um, uh, people will sit at the computer and start drawing things and start changing them and adapting them and so on. And I'm, saying, and I'm looking over their shoulder and I'm talking to them and then suddenly they'll go, hey, I've got an idea. Go out, go out into the conservatory outdoors with an with a A3 pad and a felt-tip pen for half an hour. And probably in half an hour you will sort out what you're trying to do because the computer can control you, can control your, the way you think about design because you didn't design the software. None of us design, we, we are not software designers. I think we probably should be, but we're not. We don't do that business of, of, of working out the algorithms for curves and lines and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, they are important. So the single most important uh, uh, move in, in design in my uh, lifetime has been this concept of vector graphics. Vector graphics is what enables us to use computers to draw. Um, and then following that on from that, the analytical tools which are probably more, you would consider more a part of structural engineering, engineering tools, but architects use them. Um, architects are very interested in digital fabrication, or I should say designers, I'm not allowed to use the word architecture, but designers are interested in digital fabrication. And finally, and the crucial link back to building information modeling is, is parametric is parametric modeling. So vector graphics, and again, in, in my experience, uh, these are the three key aspects of it on CAD, spline curves, which even, even that original, weirdly, somebody in the government knew that arcs were important. It's a very funny thing to see, isn't it, in a major kind of government diagram, drawings, lines, arcs. Could have been 
all sorts of things, but no arcs. But they're right because of um, the difficulty of, uh, of splining or of making uh, complex geometry out of curved surfaces and, have, have, and of building them. And of course, finally, in our, uh, in our trade, finding form uh, and how the computer helps us to do that. So CAD, just, just to let you know, wasn't, didn't originally mean computer-aided design, it meant computer-aided drafting. So the software that I was using in the 1990s or that was initiated in order to help uh, architects and designers draw was simply to do that. It was, had nothing whatsoever to do with design, whatever that might be. It was just to make a line easy to make. So these were my first computer drawings. Delighted to know. Uh, at that time, you had two screen options, which was orange on black or black on orange. You could vary, just to come, <laughs> stop you getting bored during the day. You would type in that point, that's a vector, graphic point. You would type in that point, there was no mouse. You would press a button and the line would grow. You go, whoa, that's a good line, fantastic. I'll try that on with black on orange, that might look quite good. <laughs> Um, the next thing, as, the as somebody in the government recognised, the next complex thing for vector graphics to deal with was spline curves and, spli and or cur any kind of curving geometry. Uh, Two-dimensionally, splines were originally done in this way, taking a flexible rod on a drawing board and weighing them at different points in order to get these smooth curves operating through them. And they were used almost exclusively in uh, yacht boat design uh, in by nautical designers uh, to make to design sections through yacht hulls because the, there was something very elegant. They would use uh, very light timber, and they were they were building boats out of timber. So there was something very elegant about designing the shape of the sections through hulls with the same material from which they were going to be built. And it would be built in a, in a similar way. Anyway, that got translated into computer graphic form, as did uh, more complex three-dimensional geometry eventually get translated, so that we now have the facility to do things like this, which is to take a, a flat, uh, gridded Cartesian surface and deform it. Uh, in this case, to make, uh, you would imagine that would be a membrane structure, some kind of a tent-type structure, rather than a a shell structure, but that's another lecture I can go on for hours. I've already gone on for too long, probably. Um, a quick run through analytical tools. You see BIM is still up in the corner there. It's still, it's, this is still a lecture about building information modeling, in case you've forgotten. Architects use all of these things that are fed into the model, if you like, into this 3D, magical 3D model. This is the way we think all this stuff goes in. So we've got 3D scanning. Um, We've got one. <coughs> We've got one for the first time in a long time. In this university, we have a 3D scanner. Um, construction management have it. Architects don't have it. Rob's got it, actually, in his office, haven't you, somewhere? Tucked away. And if you're really nice to him, he will let you have a go with it. Not for just getting a scan of your head. <laughs> but if you're willing to go out and sort of do the foyer or something here and have a go, that's important because that allows us to take that what used to be a long process of surveying 3D information, bang that straight into the model. Uh, thermal imaging is another part of that process. Um, structurally finite element analysis is another part of that process. Previously we had to use uh, you know, uh, actual physical tools in order to do it. Now we can use uh, FEA. I should say that this presentation will go online so you can read all this stuff. Because <coughs> I haven't got time to go into it in great detail. And architects also feed this into the computer model, environmental modeling. Uh, we tend to use, because it's on our computers, it's in, in this university, Ecotech, to do sun path diagrams, to analyze uh, solar shading and so on and so forth. And more in, uh, at a more complex level, we can use computational fluid dynamics to look at things like how wind and air, anything that moves around the building, wind, air, water, sound, Anything that moves, we can analyze now with computational fluid dynamics. This all goes back into the computer model. So does um, fabrication of components. Okay, also goes back into the computer model. And uh, uh, I've, 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 there's more than that, but that kind of sums up the, the possibilities at the moment for how the computer.
computer can control machines, cutting, milling, and printing are the primary movers in that world. So that's um, Peter Rice's uh, extraordinary arches that were built for the Seville Expo in 1997, I think. I think in the last century. So all of the, this is all stone that's been digitally cut very, very accurately. And of course, normally a stone is a low tensile compressive structure. He's taken all the, all the tensile loads out into, the, into that steel. So it's very structurally expressive. Here's a machine, here's a circular saw cutting a piece of stone, laser controlled circular saw, very, very accurately cutting, uh, in that case, Portland stone from, uh, from down on the south coast of England. Uh, milling is another process I'm sure you're familiar with. Now we can start to get to more complex three dimensional forms. If you can cut the foam cores, say in the GRP or FR, FRP material, you can then cast it and form it into extraordinary shapes like this, which is a project by Knox NOX Architecture in, um, in Holland. And most recently, um, 3D printing. So that's the first printed bicycle, I believe, um, done by, uh, built by the European Space Agency, I think. It's something they do in their spare time, they're not making rockets. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll bang out the bicycle. Um, so yes, uh, just useful to know, machining, you know, traditionally what we do here in the workshop and other places, that's forming objects by removing material, 3D printing involves and we've got a machine that we can do this, but only on a model scale. And we can then make small things like ashtrays that look like the path yes. or something like that. We can't really do much. We can't make a bicycle, but nevertheless. Oh. How am I doing? Keep going. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a kind of key link back to, back to uh, building information modeling, because the, the, building, the inf building information model um, is actually, to us architects, to designers anyway, it's a three-dimensional model that has all the information that I've just described put into it. It's all in that model. So every, all, the, all the analytical work that we've done structurally, environmentally, in terms of fabrication, in terms of design, is all in that 3D uh, model. And then, that model, can we then start to work with that model. Now, there's two ways that we work with it, parametrically. The great the advantage of parametric computing is that we can alter the geometry of the model, <coughs> optimize geometric solutions so we can use less material. So we need to span a big span dome roof of some kind, and we've designed it in a particular way. We can use that parametric model to optimize that geometry, use less material, less elements. The other thing the parametric model allows us to do is this, is to, is to build a database of information so that every object, oh, sorry, that's the Here's an example of the geometric one, this roof which is designed to over the, you know, the forecourt of the British Museum. Um, can I bang on? You're alright, you've got, yeah, you've got a right. couple of minutes more, okay. you're, you're alright. Just quickly to note the interesting thing about this geometry, which looks regular, on plan it's like the tangential spokes of a, of a bicycle wheel, um, uh, crossed uh, orthogonally to make the triangles. The problem they had was that the rectangular form of the forecourt and the circular form of the reading library, the circle wasn't in the middle of the rectangle. That's an issue. It was slightly wrong. So Arabs, who, did, who designed the geometry of this, designed the first parametric uh, computer program software that said, if we move, and I've, see, I've seen this work in real time, if you move that circle very slightly in the context of that rectangle, just a little bit, the computer program optimizes the minimum number of triangular cuts that are needed for that, for that change. So that when you go back to the fabricator, the digital fabrication, because obviously all of these were just, all of these cuts, uh, these glass cuts were made on a machine, uh, they were never drawn, they were just digitally fabricated from a, 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 an Excel program, that the software minimized the variation, the, the number of, of triangular groups. So that's geometric optimization. And then the other part of parametric modeling means that when we, as architects and designers, build a three-dimensional model, we can build it in such a way that any object in that model, whether it's part of the M&E servicing infrastructure, whether it's part of the structure, whether it's the facade, the cladding, whatever it is, 
When you click on it, not only is it a line, uh, a vector line, it is also an object and in the real world. It's a pipe. It's a 15 millimeter copper tube. It's three meters long. I know where it's being sourced in the world. I know how long it's going to take to get to site. I know who the manufacturer is. Okay? And if I make any change in that, because, oh, that window's not quite right, I've got to shift it over a bit, the whole model goes click, 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 and automatically makes adjustments for me. That's the, the beauty, if you like, of parametric modeling. So it can geometrically optimize, but it can also optimize in terms of the organization of, of the components that go into a building. So, to sum up, I think I'm about right. Um, and here's some examples from a program called, my mind's not completely, thank you, Bill. Revit, a program called Revit, which we tend to use more and more often now in, in design uh, in terms of the, the building information model because it has that faculty for uh, every object, every line or component in it um, is also a part of the database. It's also geometrically um, reconfigurable parametrically. And as that says here, BIM allows everybody to access that model. And therefore, if the engineer grabs it and goes, hold on a minute, I'm not happy, or the structural engineer goes, I'm not happy with the thickness of that, I need that to be X millimeters longer. The model itself will make the necessary adaptations. It will go back to the architect. The architect will pull his hair up and go, you're joking. You're going to make the whole building 50 centimeters higher than I originally wanted it. This is a disaster, which is why it's all nonsense that I'm talking about. But nevertheless, um, as I said, change everywhere um, will automatically update. That's great. This goes back to the fabrication thing. You build families of objects, or we do we, as designers, and um, they again allow you to quickly make adaptations, alterations, and additions. Uh, there's visualization, and I'll come. I, I will, if I, they give me time, come back to that quickly. Just as a very, the very last thing I do, because the visualization does not just mean to designers that you can show the client what the thing's going to look like. The other thing you can do is you can show the contractor the sequence of operations that you think as a designer will be needed in order to achieve the, uh, the final product. Now that means that when they are tendering for your job and they're looking at the design so the specification of, of uh, what's going into the project, they also, if you as an architect can also provide them with this critical path analysis of how the thing can be built, this makes, this makes the, again, this, this business of talking to builders, talking to contractors about, uh, about how we achieve things a lot easier, a lot better. Um, as I said earlier, you can extract anything from this model. Previously, as a, that, was, you know, that was a vector rectangle with some uh, studs inside <coughs> the architects. That was what we originally thought that would be. Now, I can take any one of those studs I can take it out and I know that it's a, a piece of softwood timber that's going to come from Canada and it's whatever dimensions it is and when it's going to arrive on site and so on. It goes straight into my specs, which is fantastic, which I have to say. And then of course in the end, when you've got your finished building, the building information model lets you, um, lets you or the client or for support, the, these are very, very important people that architects don't talk about very much, facilities and management. You know, you think you, you give birth to a building. It's a bit of a man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that. <laughs> it's a bit like that. Anyway, the bit, you, we give it, and we give it to the world, and then we go, thank you very much, goodbye. But that's the beginning of its life. You know, that is where it starts. And I, again, as an architect, I know because I've talked to people that, uh, site managers, caretakers, people that run and look after buildings. You, you then go back and you go, well, how, how well is this building performing? You know, what are the problems? What are the issues? We constantly need feedback. We need to learn over the years, decades, hundreds of years of the building, how it's getting on, you know, what, what kind of feedback we can get. Well, in theory, again, the, this, the fact that everything is logged very carefully, the fact that a component in this building, this, this uh, rail that stops you, might stop you falling off the edge of that roof, has been barcoded, and the guy that is the site manager can come along years later, say it's a school or something, can go shoot across it and go, oh yeah, it was one of them, it was sourced, it 
at a certain place, but uh, it, we've got all the specification, go straight back to the computer. That is very useful. Um, blimey. Sorry, quick. So, as a just quick final thing, I want to just prove to you that architects do think about um, construction of buildings. Uh, this, is a, this is a third year project. Um, this is a, a, an undergraduate student who, again, was looking at the process of construction, not just thinking about, okay, at the end, there's going to be a building and what it looks like, but how to achieve that. Don't look too closely at the beam sizes. You know, okay, I mean, some of them might be. Where do you think the 3D printing will take us in terms of the industry? Well, there are, there are guys out there now that are 3, 3D printing houses. Okay. They're taking big, huge, great gantries onto site and, and sort of trying to do that. I mean, I have no idea but, you know, what, what that technology I could not predict, I could possibly predict. But, uh, again, there are, there are materials the material science industry, there are databases now of material where the guys are pushing atoms around to make materials. You know, so at the moment, the, the fiber, particularly the carbon fibers, the amide fibers, the stuff that DuPont are developing, in theory could enable us to, to do things that we could not have conceived not that long ago. So that, you'll, you know, it's a good question, but the whole area of synthetic material science rather than necessarily 3D printing. But it is something that's impinging on our on our the way we think all the time. And what, what boundaries are we pushing? Sorry to keep asking. What boundaries are we pushing? You know, because we can make different shapes and forms, or is it because we've got stuff that will last, you know, two hundred years rather than fifty? I mean, I'll, I'll be, How long have you got? I don't know, all right. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's absolutely it's absolutely the right question to ask. Yeah. I mean what all we can do I think is to you know, the history of engineering, in our, my opinion, whether it's environmental structure, has been about efficiency. You know, if you want to make you want to make a bridge that can get from here to there, you use what materials that science is available at the time, what technology is available at the time, and you make you get it from here to there. And then you make it in order to get from there, and then that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
But the, the only reason it gets bigger and bigger is because of all those things, of the science, material science, materials technology, designers, it's yeah. everybody, okay. isn't it? It's the culture yeah, yeah. of the world that makes the pyramids. It's not any one thing or one driving thing, I don't yes, think. Yes. So what these guys will do in the future, God only knows. Yeah, yeah. And thank, thankfully, I don't, you know, that's good in a way. I hope that, I, hope I, I couldn't possibly imagine what they'll do no. with the technology and with no, the... No, no, no. That's new, I mean, that's but it should be a fit, but ironically, and again, going back to being and going back to sustainability that you were talking about the other day, Ironically, designers really have always, you need to be efficient with resources, with materials, mm. in order to make things better and more interesting. You do need to be efficient. You do need to, you know, a carbon fiber rope bridge is going to go a lot, lot further. In theory, it will use a lot less resource to go further, more for less, which is fucking further. So, yeah, yeah, do more for less. So, yeah. good question. Good speech. <laughs> <laughs> Surely that's enough. I, I mean, in terms of your view on, on, on the key benefits of using this, mm. what, what, what do you see as the key benefit? Um, I do think it's back to the software again. And I, in, in terms, if you go just to practice, to marketing to practice, um, for us as architects, it is it is very helpful. It, it's efficient. It, it minimizes, um, the parametric model in particular, does minimize the amount of time we spend writing specifications, right? Doing, you know, actually doing all that stuff. So there, there is a, a, an efficiency in that. And I, I think even that last animation shows that in terms of the way you think about design and think about building, that we, we, we are more encompassing of the real world in that way. I don't think that BIM as a, a government sponsored initiative is going to make any difference whatsoever to the world. I think that the, the soft computing is, has an enormous impact on the world. And as you said to me the other day, BIM, the BIM is almost now already they're talking about something called cloud BIM. If you Google cloud BIM, you're, you're, they're already going, oh, well, the yeah, BIM was interesting, but cloud BIM is much more interesting. And no, more names are already beginning being dropped into the to that world. Now, cloud BIM means that none of the software that we currently use is going to be important because you will be able to access online all sorts of exec executive, executable files. So it doesn't matter that you have any particular software in your, in, on your computer. It'll suddenly be... But that's more about computing than it is about the government, you know, a, a sort of social initiative, I think. So I, I just think as long as we're aware of it, the key, the, I think the key drops back into communication across the yeah, team absolutely. because it doesn't matter how powerful or sophisticated the software gets, you know, if the team isn't using it in a collaborative way and getting the best out of it, it's no good to you. It doesn't matter. You know, you, we, we, have, we have to, as professionals, be working together. Someone said that about, what was it during the last war? There was one error message in, you know, in, in, in code, you know, when Turin was working on the encryption systems in the Second World War that were critical to the development of software. Um, there was one, they, they got their clue to cracking the Enigma code because one tired German guy, this is not, hang on, what's that? Was one <laughs> night happened to go, happened to just feed in a couple of wrong digits and the guys at Blake, uh, Bletchley Park went, got it. So what you're seeing, you know, it doesn't matter how, how good the software is, if you're not giving it the right information at the right time, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So, the, yeah, I think humans will still survive in all this. <laughs> Problem. Yeah. Questions from the floor? You've got an architect up here. You've got great opportunities to challenge you. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I just wanted to say something really, just to reiterate something that Pete said earlier, and also it's related to the last comments, which is, one thing that building does is, is remind the, certainly remind the designer, the architect maybe, about all the responsibilities of, of what you're doing in terms of material use and also all the different people that you have to work with, whether that's fabricators or whatever. And there's, so there's the kind of, I think that's interesting for us as architects, but that's, and it also is, at least it's given us 
the opportunity for us to be talking to each other. You know, it seems we're in the same building. Uh, you know, it, it, as we said, it's ridiculous. It hasn't happened before. But it, you know, it just we're not. We're kind of divided rule in a way. So, uh, so sorry. Can I introduce you to Adam Jones, <laughs> architect here? Adam Jones, Rob Gowie, construction management. These guys are trading people in this room to build the buildings for you architects. You know, for once, finally, we're all in the same room. Last two weeks ago, we even had the head of architecture. Head of construction management and the dean all in this room together for the first time since I've been at this unit. They, they all came in because apparently they for, had for a lecture. For, a le for your lecture, well, yeah. for your today, conspicuous by their absence. Yeah, I know. Peace out. Oh, sorry. Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of away days on, so don't take it. Don't take it personally. Don't take it, don't take it personally. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That would be viral, won't yeah, it? <laughs> Pete says. Absolutely. All right. Go so, opportunity. Last time. Difficult questions, I know. Too benign. I was going to say that um, the, the 3D scanning technology, they actually are starting to bring out photogrammetry 3D scanning technology for you guys. Go around the camera. camera. Triangulate. Print it in tiny little bits. We've got one of those printers. <laughs> we could make little bricks that size, and then we could get something to stick it together. Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs>